Welcome to another exciting episode of uh, Pitch Camp. Welcome to the 26th episode of the Pitch Camp podcast series. Pitch Camp is an initiative brought from uh, from us to help entrepreneurs to pitch their ideas better to investors and also to help their startups grow through our sales coaching programs. We are extremely focused on entrepreneurs, early stage entrepreneurs to help them grow either through an external funding source or through their customer revenue models. Right. So with this today, I'm very excited to welcome Sridhar Ranganathan, who is the founder CEO of uh, B2Brain.com. And you know, without further ado, let's let's get into the conversation on understanding how sales tech is bringing up new opportunities in a connected remote world today. So welcome Sridhar, welcome to Pitch Camp and welcome to the podcast. Hi Bimlesh, thanks for having me at Pitch Camp. Uh, I've been know uh, an audience in uh, several of your sessions and i think it's really an exciting format and you bring really nice uh, speakers and topics to the, to the audience and mm-hmm. thanks for having me excited to be here yeah absolutely thank you so much uh, you know this is a new series that we are starting uh, focusing on uh, you know on technologies that help companies startups propel their growth Right, and uh, you know that's when I found uh, you know B two Brain working on a very niche, exciting space, and you know that's where I thought you know it will be good to have this conversation to our audience as well. So uh, talk to us a little bit about your background, uh, you know your journey until you started B two Brain, and then we'll get onto what was the concept behind B two Brain and, and where we are today. Okay, sure. Uh, so uh, I'm an engineer. I passed out of uh, IIT Madras back in '95 with a degree in naval architecture. Wow! Okay. As far away from what I'm doing right now as possible. <laughs> right. Except that both involved using the brain. Okay. Uh, and uh, I used to work in shipping for a few years. Um, as a ship manager, taking care of oil tankers and bulk carriers, and as a superintendent of the ship. And the job there was to make sure that the ships did not stay in the port for too long. Right. Okay, they were out at sea running voyages and running charter for the clients so that the company will fetch money. Okay, So in a sense, the job was to make sure the ship was ready enough to leave the port as soon as possible. Or I was in charge of you know, releasing ships from the port Okay, as fast as possible. Then as uh, serendipity would have it, one thing led to the other, and uh, I ended up uh, becoming a project manager at uh, Advinet, okay. which is what Zoho was called back in the day, okay. the turn of the century. Then uh, Zoho, Advinet was going through a transformation. We introduced product management as a profession. I was probably one of the first few product managers starting there, you know, looking at building products, taking them to the market, and so on. Uh, spent some fantastic years of growing at uh, Advinet with uh, working closely with the founders and Several people in the entrepreneurial ecosystem today with whom I've had an amazing opportunity to work with. Okay. Fantastic. Several startups, ex Zoho startups, highly likely that we would have interacted in some form or fashion. Right. Both Freshworks, Charge B, Basilio, what have you, many of them. Then I ended up moving to Yahoo, where I uh, you know, had the opportunity to build some very nice uh, consumer facing products. Yahoo Jobs, Yahoo Maps, local, uh, all of these products. I uh, was kind of I was a product manager back then. Again, another startup mafia from Yahoo, right? <laughs> we talk of you know right. several people, ex Yahoo, who have started. Highly likely, we've interacted, interfaced, and uh, you know, it's it's such a such an energizing thing to work with people in in your company who then go on to build new stuff. Okay. It's always a different. Uh, caliber of people and excitement that we have. And from Yahoo, I ended up going to Inmobi. I was the first VP of product at Inmobi. Um, okay. And uh, you know, the company had this rocket ship growth from 2008 to 2012, 13. When I left uh, in 13, I was uh, initially running products there. And uh, later on, and that's also where I met my co-founder, Karthik. Who again, of course, he's from uh, IIT Madras as well. Both are from the same batch, okay. but we ended up working very closely at Inmobi, so we got to know a lot more about you know each other and our ability to complement uh, what we are doing. 
uh, and as we left in Mobi, the idea of what we were going to do, kind of the genesis happened, uh, which, uh, you know, I used to tell people that I moved from, you know, having done product management for like 10, 12 years, I, where I was in charge of shipping product, I used to say, I moved from releasing ships to shipping releases. <laughs> that was the right. uh, nature of how the job changed. But I've also had a very, very keen interest in, you know, user experience design and interaction design. This, this is an area, having been a naval architect or trained to become a naval architect, you know, drawings are my life blood, literally. Right. right. So right. I used to think of how do things happen when users have to interact with something. And that passion continues. It's, it's not gone away all the time. You know, people in my team will tell me, you know, it, it can get sometimes very difficult to kind of get some stuff out because we'll be making sure certain things are really, really proper. And we still, of course, make a few mistakes, but you know, we focus on making sure we have given our best to the user experience before something goes out. Right. So the uh, genesis behind what is B2Brain today uh, has been literally my startup or entrepreneurial journey. Okay. In all the three places previously, which have which boast famously of amazing mafia, amazing people who have come out and started companies. Uh, I was an employee early or mid stage or whatever. But once I came out of uh, Inmobi, I, along with my co-founder Karthik, we were thinking about uh, you know what is it we wanted to build. We started a company called Credibase. Right. Okay. And uh, Credibase set out to build a business graph for the world, for the B two B world. Our okay. simple thesis was that. Businesses and companies are built by people like you and me. Okay, so the interactions between us could lead to amazing use cases that could be found. And we went through several iterations. Uh, you know, we, we, we built a team. We always believed that it's important to have a very passionate and spirited team behind doing stuff. I mean, it's it's very very natural and obvious that one can't do everything by oneself. Right. But the even more exciting thing about building companies is the fact that you know you bring in people who are very passionate about some area and you know throw the problem at them or throw them at the problem and support them in their ability to do stuff pretty soon you realize that magic is brewing and it happens every day okay one of the things we have held very close to our uh, hearts and almost as an execution culture in the company is code goes to production every working day Okay. Okay. So it's you're... it's something. Sorry. No, I'm saying so. You're not just a you know continuous integration company, but you're a continuous delivery company. Yes, it 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 has to. I mean, I actually think that code going to production is literally the heartbeat of a cloud company. Right. Okay. If you're doing it at regular intervals, you have a very fundamental, amazingly inbuilt momentum in the in the business. Okay. okay. It just gives you that many faster high frequency opportunities to test and validate hypotheses and keep learning and going forward, right? Absolutely. And the first stage of a startup is always this very rapid learning of how do you get a product market fit? Or when do you get a sense that you have actually hit product market fit for that stage of the company? Right. Right. That's one of the things I've, I've, uh, uh, I tend to believe in is that the PMF or so is not like a cut and ride stage in the company, but it's an ongoing evolution. Absolutely. You you evolve the product, you end up attacking a different or adjacent segment. You have to hit PMF there. Right. You have to hit some revenues or you have to hit some user growth or engagement. Any such important North Star metric for the company, the PMF is an ongoing exercise, right? Are you on it? With every customer that churns or every user that drops off, you're looking back and saying, look, do, do I have to do something to stay in that PMF zone? Okay, so in that sense, you know, I respect teams that can actually ship stuff. Okay, and uh, so we've always looked at that as an important uh, uh, parameter of how we build the company and how we bring in that execution culture. Now, the nature of when we started uh, Credibase, um, the problems and the spaces kind of kept evolving. We also kept learning and iterating on what was going on and so on. So somewhere middle of last year, 
there was this uh, i was working with a few customers and there was this moment of enlightening or the light bulb moment if you will call it right where you know we saw that several companies b2b companies and and again post my yahoo times every all my experiences been on b2b companies and i i continue to be very very passionate about that yeah. so everything that i'm talking you have to look at in the context of b2b and not so much consumer focus we believe in user focus not b2c as a business model now we saw that companies all around were investing in inside sales in middle of last year okay uh, and uh, what would happen was these teams were generally you know given a very short ramp time to you know get to full uh, full quota okay at the same time these teams also saw significant churn okay right and and teams would be put in place people would be hired and given like 2 3 months of training as to ramp up and get to full quota they'll churn in like 12 to 18 months which is crazy and these were the teams on which companies are betting significant <laughs> projected revenues right. okay people will say look we are 70 80% inbound revenue where you know we get leads and we qualify and then we do demos and close and stuff but in the next one one and a half years we want to invest in outbound and we want to make uh, the revenue from outbound to be equal to 50 60% or a majority right now if if that's the world where you believe your bread and butter is going to be or you're going towards and you're hiring people and you're spending time on training and uh, stuff and they were chaining uh, churning in 12 to 18 months something was not adding up okay so uh, in several conversations i used to talk to uh, with sdrs and account executives and all that one of the things that started showing up was the fact that across the board people would say look i'm not getting engagement on my outbound campaigns my emails don't get responses you know people don't respond to me very well in linkedin or you know cold calling i mean there's a whole new school of i mean there's the whole different schools of cold calling whether it's dead alive and all that i'm not getting into all of that right but uh, the problem uh, that that at least we could observe was a fact that people were focused on sending boilerplate sales pitches to their prospects and expecting the prospect to listen to them it was hard and it continues to be high it'll always be hard right true people i mean if we believe fundamentally people build businesses you want to connect with the human at a human level Correct. in some way shape or form okay tools and technologies definitely can help you but it has to be along with some context of what's going on in their world exactly yeah. okay if i call you and say bimlesh i'm so and so and i'm doing this i'm this amazing stuff and i have this amazing thing to tell I don't think you will have attention span beyond like maybe five, ten seconds. You will just cut out. Okay. Right. So then it came to you know looking at so what were the successful salespeople doing? The successful salespeople were doing some things differently. They all mm -hmm. had access to the same set of tools and capabilities and data and stuff. Nothing is different, right? Right. We live in a fairly democratized world today. The successful sales people were taking time and effort to understand if there is something interesting going on in the prospects world before messaging them through any medium right okay and predominantly this used to be in the form of they will do a bunch of google searches research about the prospects company you know re recent financial news or some hiring or some product launches and things like that and they'll then look up you know some of the linkedin profiles of the people that were interesting to know whether they change jobs try and see if they can build a connection try and you know uh, build some familiarity and then put all that together in order to personalize the message that went out this kind of was the exact light bulb moment for me all of these outbound sales people were spending enormous amount of time doing google searches mm okay so if you're selling hr software you're doing google search and there is some company x you're looking for company x hiring company x job opening company x financial news right three four things okay and you will go through a, a plethora of results and so on 
if you are selling security software, you are looking at you know, five, six other different types of things about the same company. Okay. You'll say company X vulnerability issues, company X you know, threat assessments, the DDoS attacks, uh, product downtime, application issues, things like that. So depending on the business you are doing, you are looking for a set of inputs and insights about that company by doing simple Google search. Yeah. But you are spending enormous amount of time doing that. So if you have to handle, you know, 100, 150 target accounts in your outbound motion every month or quarter, each account can easily suck out between 20 to 40 minutes of your time. Yeah. Each day. Yeah. Right. Imagine if at, at 100 accounts, you are spending more than one, one and a half weeks every month on doing research. This was exactly the moment we said, look, if you are looking for information from public you know, sources about all of these companies and trying to discern the intelligence and insights from it, you should not be spending all the time. Right. We said, you know, we'll automate the whole process. OK, mm -hmm. we'll automate the whole process. So we give back like an extra week of selling time every month to you. So your chances of hitting the quota is 33 percent higher. Right. Yeah, that's okay. A, that's an excellent value proposition. Right. So that's <laughs> number one. Number two, the problem for humans is that uh, it may just so happen the fifth page of Google, which is like, you know, 45th, 41st to 50th result might actually contain something interesting for you within one of the documents in that result. Right. You may never get there. So you not just waste a lot of time. You may lose the chance to actually get to some interesting insight about the company right. simply because like clicking through four pages you get bored yeah okay you don't always do that that is the second problem the third problem is okay now i found some insight next question is who do i go and reach out to in this company okay so we said we fundamentally have to solve for the reason you are reaching out to a prospect hmm. And if you're reaching out to them, who are the right people to engage with? If we just solve for those two, we would have fundamentally solved for a problem that you're living with every day and doing in an inefficient manner. Right. Sales people, time is money. Right? Engineers, concentration is money. If you distract engineers, you lose productivity, you lose money. Right. If you let sales people run on inefficient systems and tools, the company loses top line, which is much worse. Okay. So the whole thesis behind Beta Brain was that we wanted it to be literally sitting beside you in your CRM or your sales workflow system, looking at what are the companies you are working on. Mm -hmm. In the background, do all the research for you, bubble up information on what's interesting, and then show you some talking points saying, Bimlesh, this is what is happening at Walmart. Here is why you should go and speak to them. Okay. And then giving you two or three recommended leads saying these are the people based on your business and the company uh, that you're going after. In essence, it shrinks your research time, gives you insights that you may have otherwise missed, and gives you a pathway to engage with that company. Right. Okay. All in a very non intrusive fashion, which is why the name B2 Brain, it's like the brain, right? right. It's behind a lot of your decisions, almost all of them, but it's never in your face. Okay, so that is the ethos and the principle and the backstory with which the product's been built. Fantastic. Right. So, and, and true to its nature, it sits with your CRM, Salesforce, HubSpot, Freshworks, then sales uh, engagement platforms, Outreach, Salesloft, you know, okay. several other integrations will come. But it's a very easy, nifty, and uh, ready to start with integration and user experience a salesperson can install it on the chrome browser and it connects to your salesforce and starts working we looked at the i mean the last few months there have been several changes in the technology stack in the in the whole sales ecosystem right right um, so yeah i think there's there's still a lot to go this ecosystem can be made fantastic with the uh, better tools data and intelligence so when, when did you guys start uh, you know rolling this uh, product out was it pre-covid or was it during covid that you 
that you started your early versions around the product yeah so it was very interesting uh, i think the first beta of the product which is like the very first chrome install and somebody trying it out was the day after christmas last year okay okay and in jan was when we said okay it seems like it's working for a few users let's let's kind of go and get a few more beta people mm. okay to try this out so between jan to march we were really focused on getting the beta getting a pe- getting people to adopt use it and then you know learn from how they are using it in their workflow in their in their world see how to sharpen stuff you know figure out the process for because there's a web dashboard and there is a chrome plugin right. okay, you got to figure out the process of how they are going to work together in tandem it can't be out of sync mm-hmm. how it sits with your crm learn all those integration touch points and all that so then we saw that engagement was picking up okay feb march engagement was like dramatically picking up like people were spending time on b2b okay. meaningful time on b2b but still saving a lot more time than they would have otherwise spent with Google. okay right. doing their own search so we saw engagement picking up and traffic growing and all that which is all great and then march covid came right so basically traffic tank okay i mean in hindsight i can hypothesize on how life was in right. back in march april may june right but then our whole point was look it's not like everyone's gone away is that there is a reduced usage because everyone is facing flux in their worlds right like okay, there's nothing pause. Pause. like a temporary pause yeah right and uh, you know every time a company says look we're going to downsize or we're going to cut costs and all that stuff you know what groups and functions are on the chopping block right okay. discretionary marketing spend gets taken away and sales people get fired okay these are the two most obvious things at least in the tech space uh, or you know technology computer software internet products uh, world that we live in so it was i mean there were a bunch of companies that were trying us out and we could see news coming out of several of them saying look you know people are getting uh, this thing every day i would see on my linkedin feed several people job changes or you know i'm out of job open to work all of those things right it was very it was kind of tough to kind of wade through that uh, period right but uh, the focus was look this is all going to come around some point in time we didn't know when so let's keep working on how do you make sure the user engagement and the value is being delivered properly okay let's let's worry about everything else subsequently right so thanks to the team the team was like completely focused on you know hitting the ball that's it they were not looking at the noise in the stadium right which is an important uh, thing to build um uh, sometime in middle of april we planned and did a launch in product hunt hmm okay we said look you can get initial feedback but you wanted more okay right. and and from a diverse of, and from a diverse group of people as well yeah yes precisely it's it's always nice to get initial feedback and it's very often likely the case that the first few users of the product will tell you nice things about the product just because you are being gutsy and showing the grit and you know trying to get something out people will be just nice to you right. we got to go beyond the nice to the real okay and uh, the product hunt launch was a great experience for the team okay because we saw first hand how people felt about it we were up all through the 24 hour i mean 30 32 hours or so right we had planned we had reached out to our networks we had reached out to people beyond them and had them try out and you know the saas boomi network a bunch of founders that had been part of uh, groups that had been part of friends people we had worked with previously and all of that stuff it was an amazingly supportive uh, community right across very diverse uh, groups of people we saw lots of feedback about b2 brain and people articulating how they feel this could solve their problem right okay having been a product manager one of the things i am always wary of is that i'll keep drinking my kool aid i'm very very conscious of it okay and it's an easy thing to do because 
what you're doing, the solution or the feature gives you comfort. The market shows you reality. Okay, so the more you listen and the more you adapt and recalibrate your view of what you're building to what they see you're building, it's always better, right? It was an important learning experience for us. So that kind of gave us also a sense of what is it that we should be doing as part of the roadmap and how do we get to customers? What sort of customers, segments? The whole positioning and who we are going after became much sharper and much more focused in the following three months. By June, we were clear who we want to go after. Fantastic. OK. And the moment that clarity emerged, like somebody could wake me up in the night and say, who is your segment? I could des describe. This is what is happening. right? So along this period, the uh, and I'll uh, uh, talk a little bit about where I saw the ecosystem also evolve right? in between. I also saw that this is really the time when I learned the amount of innovation that's happening in the sales tech landscape. Mm. It's incredible. Every every piece of the funnel, every step of the workflow, every type of role, all of them have you know newer thought processes, newer problems being addressed. Okay, how do you make a person productive? How do you make a step in the funnel more visible and transparent? Right. right? How do you make a step in the process or workflow more effective? Three dimensions on which innovations were happening. Right. So. Like for example, pitch camp, you give sales coaching, you want to make somebody more effective. Right. Plain and simple, right? Somebody does, you know, you have uh, products that are giving you revenue visibility, revenue intelligence. They're giving you more visibility on the step of the pipeline, right? So it was possible to kind of look at the world and say, these are the three broad dimensions in which innovation was going on. Okay, at least from where I saw. Uh, once we, identified this is the segment here is where we play and here is who we are not and here's who we are right. it then became a question of how do you repeatedly execute that go to market okay. yeah. right i would i would still say we've been building revenue momentum and added some fantastic customers to the uh, usage we've seen you know people adopted one or two people try it out and then subscribe using the credit card and then slowly, you know, the team itself starts using us. And then the manager says, look, I'm going to pay for, you know, everybody in the team and so on. That's sort of the nature of the sales motion, the go-to-market motions we're seeing. Now I know how the pieces are coming together, at least as of right now. Like even my thinking and view of the market is an ongoing product market fit right. thesis. Right. Yeah, right. very interesting. A couple of things I pick up from, uh, I know, from uh, a lot of the points that you shared. One is, you know, it's so important that also to understand what you are not while you get the clarity of what you are, right? Uh, and I just love that uh, point of view. It's so important for both an entrepreneur and as a product manager, uh, you know, perspective to very clearly understand that the segments that we will not go after, it might look interesting, but that is not where we want to spend our, you know, energies are because the value momentum is not very high. Uh, and at the same time, also to recognize the fact that okay, this is a segment that we see, you know, tremendous fit and a potential to add value over time. Right. So, so give me give me some additional nuances of of that succinct uh, distinction on on the, on what factors helped you arrive at that clarity. The most obvious analogy that one can uh, probably relate to is all babies look the same. Right. Okay, at five years, they're kind of still the cherubic faces and stuff, but at 10, they're, they're distinctly growing in their own space. Okay. So what would normally happen is, and I'm, I'm using like how conversations would go, okay, so rather than giving jargons and stuff, yeah. I'll go tell somebody, you know, this is what we do. We solve the problem of account intelligence and account research for your sales teams. And we help them be more effective, save their time, give them insights, and they can ultimately speed up their revenue pipeline or the opportunity pipeline, whichever stage they're playing in. 
then uh, questions will be, look, we already do it with LinkedIn Sales Navigator. We just do stuff or we do it in Google or we do it whatever, right? So then it will typically get down to, okay, so this is good. You're, you're using Navigator. So how do you use it? People will explain, right? I know there are some of those that we they might be able to accomplish with Peter Print, but I know that we are not equivalent to them. Right. So I don't want to fool myself by saying, look, we can do all of it. Right. That's that's the, that's like the death knell for the team as well. OK, you go and say you do everything for everybody, then you have nothing for anybody. It's a huge problem. OK, so at some point, you know, a customer is typically looking for certain factors to say that, look, these are the three or five factors important in my world of which some of them are being done by the tools that I'm currently with. And some others are less important or some others are more important. Okay. Mm -hmm. For example, the customers who work with us, okay, for them, it's very important that their SDRs or account executives have good quality account insights before they reach out to the prospects. And why is it very important? It's because they are selling some products or services to their uh, prospects, which are typically mid-market or enterprise companies. OK, mm -hmm. and in those companies, the buying cycles are typically longish, longish meaning a few weeks at least. It's not like a couple of days. It's not like within a fortnight or something. Mm -hmm. And that typically happens when you sell products with you know, annual values of say fifteen, twenty thousand dollars and more. And today it's common to hear, at least on the LinkedIn chatter, that people are able to close seven figure deals with LinkedIn and I mean, with Zoom and all that stuff. Okay. Uh, but if you're not selling something beyond the fifteen, twenty thousand dollars annual contract value, you don't need a group and a longish sales cycle and multiple people involved which means it seems a little more of a transactional sale. OK, mm -hmm. so the learning for us was account intelligence or account research is important for companies that are going after target markets and selling products of a certain value where the, the prospects might have multiple people thinking, deciding, taking on longer duration, one, two years contracts, and therefore will have like a proper buying process. Mm -hmm. OK. If you're selling something which is like hundred dollars, two hundred dollars, no, it's it's not worth the effort, right? And there might be other channels, other means by which you might uh, build your pipeline. Once that got established, it became a question of okay, what are the segments where this is true, and what are the companies where this is true? Okay, and we often use B two Brain for our own use, right? Okay, to say because that's the segment we are serving. Then the other problem that we had to uh, carefully manage and recalibrate in our uh, positioning and uh, go to market is I already use two legs. So why are you different? I already have a database. Okay. So in this, I'll, I'll give uh, a view of how I see the sales tech landscape mm -hmm. just to kind of put things in yeah. context, right? I look at it as three dimensions. Companies and products that are focused on the technology or the tools, the workflow, okay, software. Companies or products that are focused on data, okay. Companies that are focused on intelligence. This is how I'll kind of divide it. Right? All of them have advanced computing capabilities for various use cases. So I'm not getting into that. But fundamentally, are you solving a workflow software problem? Like a CRM or a sales engagement platform is a software. You need that software to do your stuff efficiently every day. OK, but what you put in into that is data and intelligence. OK, so contact databases, account directories, like the Zoom infos and done in and all that. Right. They're all data. Okay. They're pure data.
data that is necessary for you to even use run your workflow i need the list of people who i can target i need the list of companies that i must uh, you know focus on i need the list of companies that belong to my territory okay i need the list of companies from which i will carve out territory for my team all of those things right and then there are products like us and linkedin navigator and owler these are all giving you more contextual intelligence for a company okay saying yours yours uh, for company x this is what's happening so you should think about it okay we go a step further okay we say you're doing x y is happening in the company here is why x and y are connected and therefore it makes sense for you to go after them or there are you know pieces of intelligence that come out of peter brain that say you're doing x why is happening in the company x is no more relevant for y mm. okay it's an equally important thing it's 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 almost like a look back at our positioning exercise what we are not it's similar in 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 construct to telling the sales person you are not relevant for this company anymore right because company got acquired and this department you are selling to is now with the new company why are you spending time with this one it's a it's an awakening call for them and this is something we learned from a few customers who will come back and say you know i used to keep barking up this tree nothing happened i saw something from b2b brain that said this company is no more relevant for me and i stopped it and then i found that that was true hmm kind of stuff right so it's it's kind of equivalent to that like what sales people are doing every day we're doing every once in a while right mm-hmm. and saying i am positioning in this market right mm-hmm. so it was also because you know i keep telling my team and tell myself you know this, this drink your kool aid is a problem mm-hmm. okay we'll always listen to customers sit back and you know take notes and say what is it they were implying okay because nothing stops anybody today from doing something better than what i'm doing i have to be running faster sharper smarter okay to keep that edge and a fundamental part of that edge the grindstone is actually customer conversation right right and the knife is our position right so that kind of thing taught us we have to be very clear about who we are not the mm-hmm. moment it was clear who we are not our even our sales pitches became better and easier right okay in the, in the course of the conversation we'll ask okay do you use a crm yes i use okay great we work well with it do you use this tool yes i do okay great this is how they solve this problem and we solve the other problem right right because the other thing i have also learned and it's it's an important uh, uh, lesson in humility from customers is you might think the other product is bad okay you can have all the opinions about any other product in the world no one cares but if a customer is using that product and is paying for it there's some reason and rationale behind that right okay so the more you respect that situation in the customer the more you open your own eyes to say look what am i missing what am i not learning right uh, what do i not know yet okay so it became an easier conversation when we like and these are all steps it's not like one morning i woke up and had this it is not there were no light bulb moments okay right. Right. every day was learning right so that part was i mean it's always exciting for me okay to learn what is it the customer means what is it that they might be looking for and so on so to put things in context we tell them here is where we are here is where we are not this is what we do this is what we don't do hmm. now it is clearer to me right we are probably uh, rather in many tech products the biggest enemy is the status quo right it's not some other competition right saas as a world is still growing it will continue to grow for another decade or so right so we're not really fighting against each other okay the moment we were able to articulate we were different it also gave us that expanse in our own minds that this is a large market large opportunity this this is not an this is not a market risk problem it's not like somebody will come and take away my problem tomorrow right okay the problems exist and as long as humans sell in b2b 
the problem we are solving will be relevant mm-hmm. it's up to us to make the most of it okay that i am very clear right as long as human cell you must know the context of the prospect you must come across as being more informed otherwise they don't even respect you forget listening to you mm-hmm. okay so if you have to be respected you have to be informed of them if you have to be informed of them you have to make sense of the tomes of information coming your way you don't have so much time in a day you have to use tools and smarter ways to kind of interpret them if you have to interpret them there is no clean smart easy way to do it google search is the default and it's supremely inefficient google makes money you are not becoming yeah you know, more efficient let's let's accept that right and that's where b2b will play a role so that's that's the thesis for the business right but to get to this point every day of multiple conversations and learnings and you know the school of hard knocks keeps living but that's that's a, that's a journey because now it is it's this is the, it's running in the dna right i don't need to look at a slide or you know my written notes or something right. it's it's a natural and that's that's the other beauty of it right once you go through that positioning exercise and learn about how your story has evolved okay first of all your story is very natural okay second you don't have to worry about rationalizing it because when when your thinking and your articulation are kind of aligned it's very straight forward very yeah. easy okay. okay and it keeps you honest tomorrow if the problem goes away i don't have a i mean we don't have business right but today i can sit here and tell you that problem is not going away anytime soon hmm. at least for have several years right right because the root of it is to humans yeah. and humans are not going away from sales you know however yeah. much people say robots are taking over and all that yes robots will take over but robots will take over a bunch of places bunch of areas and all that and the acceptance of robots is going to be a lot more or bots is going to be a lot more in humans feeling they are the heroes right okay bots that make humans feel heroes like really sustain a lot right boston dynamics might have this amazing robot that goes and does the thing with the police department and people love it because the police department feels like looks like heroes in front of a common man yeah so that's i mean it's a example from another world but important and related all the same fantastic i had one question uh, you know regarding your uh, product hunt experience right so when you started to see this diverse group of uh, people uh, using um, you know the breed vein uh, chrome extension did you see a usage difference between geographies and between cultures or between between size of companies especially say how india based sales people use and had questions and comments on on b2 brain uh, feature functionality or feedback versus you know the sales professionals out in the us or in rest of the country were they all the same or there any differences would like to understand some nuances there okay uh it's an interesting question i never thought of it that way to be to be honest there were there were several conversations that day on the thread uh, maybe if i go now and look back at the thread and you know look through who is from where and so on some new uh, insights might emerge on it but uh, it seemed that for the people from the us okay our what are our focus markets we sell predominantly north america and india okay we don't sell in too many other geographies don't sell too many other job of this so um i'm not going to talk like you know the whole world and stuff the world we are focused on okay. sure. um and there is this uh, the logistics of product and launch it starts at 12 pacific 12 midnight pacific mm. which means in india it is still afternoon right okay and goes on till the next afternoon okay so by the time someone in the us is looking at the page there has been action from 12 noon in or 1 pm in india till about 5 6 pm in india by which time you know us east is Correct. you know 8 8:30 okay so there has been 6 hours of some sort of activity 
six hours of activity on a product hunt page is a phenomenal amount. Right. Because by that time, a lot of people have asked questions, they have commented and so on. So people in India started from a blank slate. Mm -hmm. Right. There was nothing to go by. And therefore, the initial few comments. So I'm going by, you know, I'm just recapping the thing. Sure. Chronologically, if you interpret it, it will give you a sense of both the biases because every right. system has biases. There's no biasless system, I believe. And the, the nature of how the questions evolved after that, right? So the initial few questions used to be, so what's your differentiator? What's your differentiator? Like in different forms, using different words. Right? So what's your key value proposition? What's your differentiator? What is unique about you? I mean, sides of the same coin, okay, but all the same. That had been answered by the time US opened. Mm. Okay. So when US opened, there were slightly different questions that were coming up. Why can't a HubSpot do what you're doing? Kind of okay. kind of question, right? Which is kind of pushing it to the next level. Okay. Which was interesting. It was interesting because uh, we set out to do the product and launch with a very stated goal that look, let us learn from the users and about the channel. Okay, people would ask me before the launch saying, look, what, what sort of uh, conversion and customers are you expecting from it? Mm -hmm. I have, I mean, as a product manager, I've been trained or at least have listened enough to say, typically your products are third time lucky. First version is you know, a fluke. Second is like an additional data point. Third one is when you've, you've been, you know, you've gone up and down and then now you're coming to some sort of medium, right? right. So the third time lucky is a very normal uh, parlance in, in product. Okay, I think it kind of equally applies to channels as well. Your first attempt at a channel is just to learn what the channel might be. If something happens, don't extrapolate. Okay. At least I wouldn't like to. Okay, but your second attempt is something a little more knowledgeable. Okay, you know more and you prepare better, hmm. and uh, maybe because you know a lot more. Kumar Vembu, my uh, boss at uh, Advanet, uh, used to say there's this hockey stick curve, right? With education, confidence comes down because you know more about what you don't know. And at some point in time, it tips and it starts moving up. So it's, it's that kind of a thing. So second time you learn a lot more, you're more aware and get get do something about it. And you might actually learn that you know, some things could have been done better, right? You're less uh, reckless not reckless, less adventurous second time around. Okay. Third time, you're far more measured, you're far more deliberate. Okay. Mm -hmm. But from a questioning standpoint, I thought uh, the audience in the US were probably a lot more feeling the pain at that point in time. Okay. Okay. The other uh, point, I'll uh, other fact I'll point out, which was baked into a broader Go to market hypothesis itself is that uh, one of the key segments we target today is companies in India that are going to the US right. and selling B2B. B2B SaaS today is coming of age in India. Right. There are several companies that are doing outbound motion and they all kind of understand the nature of the technology stack, the nature of problems that are to be solved to keep the SDR, second executives effective, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So rather than looking at geography, I kind of can now segregate questions in terms of people whose target market is India and people whose target market is US. The questions tend to be different right. because they're, they're kind of playing in different segments completely. Right? In India, the problems are a lot more, can I just get any sort of account and contact data? In the US, the problems are a lot more of if this is the persona, this is the kind of company, what sort of insights will uh, give me engagement with them? Right? So they're kind of different problems brought about by the nature of the markets people are playing. In. Okay. So that's, to me, that was an important learning because several people from India posted on the thread like towards later part of the day. And those questions were very, uh, focused and oriented towards a market, they were like, I can read the question and tell you this person's targeting this market. Okay. Okay. That's the nature of, uh, and uh, that's how salespeople are likely to be, right? One of the key uh, 
areas of business acumen a salesperson brings is knowledge about their market right okay and that's and that's what actually makes uh, in as the company grows uh, the the challenge for product management is actually distilling that knowledge from sales people because sales people have extremely unique and interesting perspectives of the market they play in or the segments they have right i mean this person has relationships with 50 100 200 enterprises okay key people in those enterprises they kind of can second guess the way in which those people will behave if you're able to translate distill those learnings and bring it into your product it's a different uh, uh, level of impact you can create otherwise you'll only think you know this feature has to work this way in markets it might be far more nuanced in certain markets it's, it's very nuanced right like it's it's normal in sales cycles to see that you put a credit card payment thing somebody in the us will just go pay and be done with it and move on somebody in india will come and say look you know can you do this can you you know i have a po process i have this uh, you know uh, steps to be executed this person has to approve and so on and so forth they'll just be different right. okay so we learned that those nuances existed and that kind of sharpened our like focus on how we go and pitch how we sell and you know who's the segment right so the people that we go to in uh, us markets or the people that we go to in indian companies going after us or the people that go to indian companies going after india are different mm. they're all not the same right like those are those are some again going back to the positioning thing are you going after the right people right. are you clear what you are and what you're not and if you go after the right people are you able to demonstrate some value in a manner that they can appreciate it right it kind of comes down to those factors fantastic yeah coming to the last segment uh, Shrigar, uh in the last 10 years or so, you know, we have seen sales tech uh, bring in, as you rightly said, you know, decompatibilizing the problem statements. And there's a there's a product for every step in the entire uh, sales process, right? Uh, something like, uh, you know, contact nurture, right? What full contact and clear bit does was, was until they came out, not many people even understood what problem they were solving. Right? And now today, with you know, by default, you assume that every CRM comes with that piece of a plugin or as an add-on. So now with account intelligence, where do you see sales tech evolving? You know, with this completely connected remote world that you know many of us have uh, adapted today. Uh, access to technology, access to solutions is now almost available. To everyone at the same price or at the same cost, right? So I, I see this account intelligence. Uh, quite a few startups are are coming up in this space across the world. Uh, I know of a company in Canada who is also building an account intelligence uh, company. Now, account intelligence is also going to become a default uh, sales tech stack to be adopted in an organization. Uh, we see coaching tech stack being adopted within an organization, call analytics being adopted within the organization. So now sale, so when a new sales leader is trying to set up a sales organization, not only has to think, he or she not only has to think about the, the aspects of bringing in people, but also bringing people who have a, who can adapt to consume these new technologies. So where do you see in the next five years or in the next 10 years from where you are today, how this sales tech stack is going to evolve and what will be, what would be some of your predictions to see the next big disruption happen? Okay. Loaded question. Maybe because we are at the end of 2020, the word prediction might uh, just be trending a lot more, I guess. <laughs> but, uh, so, uh, See, the easiest thing to look at a market, uh, the easiest thing to do is to complicate stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay. The hardest thing to do is to actually simplify it. Okay. Uh, and I had to learn this by trial uh, or uh, in a trial by fire when we went through our own positioning and learning, right? We still, it's, it's continuous journey. 
But in the course of doing that, at least I can clearly see the sales tech stack. I mean, as we as we talk of products that are being used by sales. Okay, let me put right. it that way. The sales stack, not even the tech stack, right? It, some of it, some of it is not tech, right? Some coaching might not be tech. It might actually be a one-to-one -one personal assistance with somebody, right? Okay, a good sales guru, like you got Morgan and uh, James Buckley and all that on your show. Right. Let's say they go and talk to a team and like coach them. It's it's not tech stack. It is the stack. These guys are, you know, helping other people get better. So I look at it in, as I said, three dimensions, but fundamentally underscored by the need that the sales leaders want their teams to be amazingly effective at building human connections and relationships. Mm. Okay. So with all the technology and all the noise and all the startup and everything, you know, the whole in South India, we call it Avil in North India, or whatever, PhD and okay. everywhere else, Popuri and Potboiler, all of that stuff put together. The underlying thing that is constant, hasn't gone away, has will never go out of fashion, is that, you know, end of the day, you must be able to build a human connection with somebody and make them trust you enough that they are willing to, you know, uh, take your demonstration or pitch or, you know, showcase as the word for them to cut you a check. That is never going to go away. Okay, so the more your tech stack is or your sales stack is aligned towards accomplishing that objective, the better it is. Right? It 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 has a longer term sustenance capability. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so in that sense, if you look at those three dimensions, right? You look at tools or technology, which is the CRM, the sales engagement platforms, all of those. And then you look at data, okay. Uh, each and, and data, and then you know insights and intelligence. Each of them will evolve very fast and very rapidly. Mm. Okay, uh, there's no there's no stopping them. There is a company called Ten Bound in uh, California. They provide sales development consulting. You probably know of David Delaney there. Um, they had a market map of sales development tools. I think early this year version two or three of that market map. And I saw version six of it come out a couple of days ago. And the version two or three, there were like 50 tools. Mm. Now it's like 500. <laughs> okay, COVID, I have to, I mean, I have to make, I have to hit all my revenue quota sitting in this position in this year. Right. Okay, that's what a sales process has been constrained by, right? You have to build all your business sitting at where you are. You're not even going out. You don't need to go out anywhere to get, get that business in. So in this situation, everyone's innovating around you know, what's happening in your phone world and your laptop world and your tablet world. And that's it. That's that's where all the innovation is going, which means because of the cost of starting a company is being, being very low and AWS, Google and uh, Azure, everybody giving free credits. If you have an idea, you can just go and try it out. Right. And getting started is like really, really easy today. Growing is not as easy. Right. So that will, I mean, I would assume that there will be like a plethora of companies coming into this space. Mm -hmm. Okay. It will just only increase. The, the pace will only increase. I know there are, you know, two, three other companies that are in the space that we are in. And some of their products look very similar to what we do. Okay. Right? All of this in the past seven months. Okay. Okay, and I would not be surprised at all if another five come in the next year. Right. Because, I mean, as an entrepreneur, you're excited by the scale of the problem, right. not by the cuteness of the feature. Right. Okay, if the scale of the problem is so large, then enough people will go after it. Right. right? And, uh, you know, some people will uh, sail through, some people may not. It's fine. It's just expect it. But, the place that actually caught my imagination, which is very interesting, is, you know, when in April, May, June, when uh, the world was in a flux, in several companies, salespeople were in a far greater flux than most others. Right. Okay. It all started with a couple of big uh, companies in the valley firing like 200, 300 people over, you know, short sessions and boom, 
like people start moving on and so on and that world it is very interesting that world kind of came together okay there are these amazing sales communities i happen to be part of okay there's rev genius there's sdr ad and you know sdr defenders several of them and typically the segment we go after which is sales development right is our number one segment account executives are the number two segment sdrs being like the top of the funnel like the, at the forefront of you know pitching the company to other people right they were also in several companies they were the first ones to be yeah. asked to leave okay so somehow beautifully they came together and these communities became amazingly reinforced like rev genius i think crossed some 10000 people or something some right. massive number right jared and uh, galam they've been doing some great work there um and one by one smaller community started okay so talking of this need for human connection this these community like scott lee's uh, scott lee and amy wallers uh, thursday night sales is like another big movement literally right and uh, closer home there are lots of sales people who are now very active in the social media and talking and just being very helpful right so this need for reinforcing human connections and staying together trying to pull each other up is the is the, it's an incredible thing that i saw despite all the tools and stuff yes you'll go back to your desk and you'll do your daily workflow but you are not missing the bigger picture that there is a world out there that is supportive for you okay this to me was an eye opener in mm-hmm. fact if everything was as it was pre covid i would not have imagined or i would not have learned of the strong interpersonal connections sales people actually are able to build right right i mean traditionally one has known that sales people are very social and so on and so forth right and you the archetype you associate with is this very nice cheerful charismatic boisterous person in a party right. like a social butterfly kind of. that's not just the archetype maybe there are lots of people like that or they may be able to pull it off but there are people who are genuinely helpful they are just a lot more helpful yeah okay don't necessarily ask you for anything in return or you know it's not a wheeled sales pitch or something right they just like i have tried a few times when i had i'm not a I'm not a sales person sales person i'm a founder doing sales right right so for me it's a new learning ground a new a completely new wicket to play right Absolutely. with a little bit of knowledge on cricket i'm trying to play baseball <laughs> okay so <laughs> you can imagine the you know the uh, hoops i have to go through so but when i ask stuff very very qualified very clear very helpful information comes back from people that i don't even know hmm. which is amazing right True. so on one hand i can you know predict that you know and and my prediction will generally be fine because i'm i'm an amazing clear one i'll say several more companies will come in the next in the future right given the easy enough statement that can never go wrong <laughs> yeah right but the point is uh, yes i believe there will be a lot more companies coming in each of these steps okay the challenge for them really will be in finding their go to market in finding their uh, segments hmm. product building and innovation is never a problem anymore right it's your go to market in fact in one of a uh, couple of recent conversations i have had with people i was saying the two areas which at least are on top of mind for me and you know i think we I, i know as a company as a team as a person i have to really push down like you know uh, 200% on it is distribution and storytelling right okay most other things in today startups are within your control distribution is in the control of the recipients and the channels okay storytelling is in the control of the receiver okay like in conversation right listening is 50% right so you could tell whatever you want if they heard some random stuff then it it's of no use or uh, you know it's it's not effective so when you think of it that way the real uh, place where uh, you know or rather the real factors behind which companies or products might go on to be successful 
is in cracking their distribution and the storytelling facet of their business right from that sense i know if there are 500 startups on the sales development market map uh, in the v6 probably there'll be like a thousand in the next six months it'll just double every six months or nine months or something that will happen but getting to the to the segments the the finesse with which you kind of execute on those segments is not going to be easy it's going to take a lot more focus right uh when stars in india started say five ten years ago like zoho was one of the first few companies in SaaS, mm-hmm. right and uh, i was you know extremely fortunate to be part of that uh, journey back then right see the we used to say we have to move from single cpu shrink wrapped products to stateless java applications hosted on the web on the grid that's i remember those uh, words right so that is back in 2003 okay so it's been several years like roughly two decades now at those point on though in in those days it was just a question of standing up can you stand up a product can you actually pull things together because people are used to systems which had lots of code some code will do some work Correct. most code will like you know show a ui that you couldn't you couldn't get you wouldn't want to look at second time hmm. okay text written in camel case and stuff okay so that's the world i came from <laughs> but yeah. when we moved it it moved to saying look there is a human reading this it's not a shell script that's reading you right. okay so let's build for humans so i always say products for humans and technologies for machines right so in 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 that sense you're going to see several more startups awesome. okay my linkedin feed every day is like filled with amazing products and interestingly of late i'm seeing like companies put out new uh, videos of introduction videos and uh, advertisements of what they're doing and stuff right that's having a fit and finish which i'm not used to hmm. which is a fantastic evolution in the way companies want to tell their story right it's a, it's a, it's a very very i mean i would say it's to me when i look back of of the days it's a seminal mo- moment when a company that's coming out of the blocks is telling a story in a really attractive fashion it's non trivial and it takes takes a lot of thinking and execution and you know willingness to hold yourself up to a higher standard because now you are selling to a global audience right right you're not selling to like you know your your uncle or you're not selling to you know, friends from college or you're not selling to previous bosses or anybody right, right. you're selling to people you may never have known before from that sense i think this stack is very very ripe for disruption okay right. and on one end you will have the biggies trying to grow inorganically and stuff like that on the other end and in between there'll be lots of success stories of companies that have hit a certain scale uh, like gainsight is a recent example right. zoom info for the longest time was like the underdog but will keep getting spoken about all the time Right. And then when they reveal their S1 and their IPO plans and market cap and stuff, everybody just, you know, start, start up and took notice, right? And they went like a completely virtual roadshow and so on and so forth, right? They went IPO in, in the pandemic, in the midst of it. Right. And they went with like a 13 billion market cap and stuff. So it's a non-trivial business anymore, okay? And there are companies that are going after that space, right? If you have a... $10 billion company in a space, that space is going to live for a while. Right. It's not evaporating anytime soon, which means new paradigms in that space will be identified. Some might get taken up by the bigger guys, but a lot might you know, try to go the long haul, some of which might survive and get to a new paradigm. Right? That's going to happen. Snowflake's IPO was like another big deal. Right. Right? Uh, DNB went. IPO, Gainside got acquired, right? Several startups in the space also got recently funded and Gong has been uh, talk of the town. You have, you know, you have companies like Gong, Chorus, then Wingman, all of these guys are there. And, you know, in the data space, there's Slintel, these guys are doing some amazing stuff, right? So it's only going to increase, okay? Because 
the uh, the other area i feel we often miss out when we think of uh, you know where is the world headed is that our world view is formed based on you know the interfaces we work with right mm-hmm. our linkedin feeds if our linkedin feed talks of everything good then we're like okay world is good correct okay but our linkedin feeds probably like a very very ignorable sliver of the whole world yeah right in the us alone when outreach did a, a fundraise a few months ago they said us alone has got about 6 plus million sales professionals mm-hmm. and they have gotten to like what something like 100000 or 120000 number of that so think of the market opportunity they are looking at right and think of the size of their company they are one of the two three top guys in that space okay so whatever you imagine to be the market the market will amazingly surprise you true right so whatever you imagine might be the number of new startups that might come up you okay, probably see like 2 to 3x of that mm-hmm. okay that's why I, i say you know there'll just be a, a plethora of innovation happening in the space like it it will get disrupted there's no two ways about it got it right. no, fantastic so, shridhar this has been an a very enriching and an interesting conversation from you know somebody who by profession has been a product manager and then now turned entrepreneur trying to solve a very sales specific problem uh, you know great insights a lovely conversation you know as a last parting shot you know in your last one year uh, journey you know some three lessons that you learned that you would want to have it for any, for any entrepreneur if you can talk about three shout outs so sure. yeah so uh, i I'll, i'll talk about those that are very close to me okay sure. i'm not this is not a prescriptive thing but things that i keep close one is you know just figure out the art of storytelling there's no two ways about it you have to tell a story to multiple people all the time right that's that's one two is as i said the existence of a business is almost determined at least startups right and that's the space we are in i'm not uh, in a different world so existence of and the growth of a company is determined by its distribution what's your go to market like how are you going to grow just focus on thinking about those all towards what is your north star metric if your north star metric is engagement figure out how you're going to do that if your north star metric is revenue figure out how you're going to do that if, if it's something else what would be that that's like how are you getting the distribution to hit that north star metric right the third is find a way to keep your execution engine on okay so this is one of the things uh, in fact i would significantly credit my co-founder uh, karthik to for instilling that uh, dna in us right karthik's point always is look for a startup just being alive one more day is a big deal okay and that's just just the way it is that it comes to the territory or the terrain but it's important to keep moving you can move sideways you can move front you can move back doesn't matter it's important to keep moving okay never stop is like the horses and elephants right people say right. if the horses and elephants lie down it's hard to bring them back okay and i'll i'll leave you with one uh, example from shipping mm. okay today i was surprised i didn't bring up too many shipping ports but <laughs> they are generally filled in my because i sailed for a year i saw how shipping systems work very close in, in very close quarters so ships engines are massive engines okay yeah. like two people can get into one cylinder and they'll be like five cylinder engines and stuff okay they burn 50 tons of oil every, every day when running to start the ship to start the engine you need air not fuel you can't start the ship engine with fuel at least the big bulk carrier oil tanker mm. but to run it you need fuel okay it's like the zero to one and one to n problem in a startup Right. In zero to one, you need a different kind of power, motive power to move it. One to n, why do you need uh, fuel? Why why can't you use fuel to start? Because nothing is moving. Fuel won't even burn. You need com- highly compressed air, thirty atmosphere compressed air, to start, right? 
So in a startup as well, if you if you stop and start up, it's a much, much, much tougher thing to do. In fact, looking back from credit base to B2B, b 2 brain was a pivot. I would almost say it's easier to pivot when you're in motion. Right. It's very hard to pivot when you stop and restart. Right. Okay, so find ways to keep your execution engine running. That's like the art of survival, art of keeping going. That's it. This has been a very wonderful, very exciting conversation. Thank you so much, Shredar. And you know, with this, we come to the end of uh, today's podcast. Uh, you know, we look forward to each one of you. You know, to subscribe to our YouTube channel. We are on Anchor FM, on Google Podcast, Spotify. So do subscribe us. And until the next episode, have a great weekend, and see you soon on the other side. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, Bimlesh. Thanks for having me. Uh, happy holidays and. Uh, Wish everybody an exciting 2021. Thanks, Shiva. Wish you all the same as well. Thank you.